Good morning and welcome to Meadow Heights Church. Sorry, my mic was muted. Thank you for joining us in person on today. And if you weren't able to make it in person, thank you so much for joining us online. We're glad you could just be here to worship with us. I'm gonna get started with a word of prayer and then we're gonna jump right into worship. So if you guys wanna go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads as we pray this morning. God, I pray that as we worship you this morning and as we can just gather in your presence that you will be here with us. God, I pray that you would just, um, uh, your presence would just overwhelm us this morning, God. I pray that you would fill our hearts and that you would fill our spirit this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you guys want to go ahead, we're going to go ahead and worship. If you guys want to stand on up, we'd love for you guys to interact and join us in worship this morning. Amen. Come on, put your hands together.
love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you Christ, my name. 
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. For Jesus, the Lord, is the victory. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And God, this morning, we're so thankful that your word remains true and that you are a living hope. God, I pray as we enter into this transition, God, I pray as we enter into this uh, time of the reading and the teaching of your word, that you would be here, that you would bless us, that you would anoint us. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive your word, our ears to listen, God, and that we would retain and that we would use the stuff that we're being taught out of your word, God, and we would apply it to our everyday lives, God, that people will see the gospels and your teachings through us, and they want to sit, they look at us, and they say, I want what that person has. I don't know what it is about them that's different, but I want that. God, I pray that you would anoint and bless Pastor Robin on this morning, and that you would bring forth the word that you've laid on his heart to, to your people. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, thank you so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Wonderful job, praise team. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We're continuing to look this morning at the, the woman at the well. And lots of the things that we just sang about, we're going to consider in the life of this woman. And this morning, remember last week we entitled the sermon that Jesus loves the ignorant. He loves us even when we don't understand. He loves us when we don't get it. He loves us when it doesn't make sense to us. And today we're gonna to look at Jesus loves the sinner. And I want us to consider what it means for God to love the sinner. Because I think in our culture, in many ways, uh, we have watered down, convoluted, and changed what it means for God to love something. We, we, have, we have created a, a system and a world in which love is just God embraces us for everything that we are. And God embraces us for everything that we do. And God embraces us for all the ways that we want to think or the ways that we want to worship. But when God approaches this woman at the well, that's not exactly how he loves her. Now, I believe that when, when God shows love to this woman at the well, he shows greater love to her than any love you and I could ever express. He, sh he shows love to her in its truest sense. It, it is the most pure form of worship that could come from the Lord. Now, if I was to give a, a, a class on evangelism, this would not be the text that I would think to start with. 
Because when, when Jesus approaches this woman, he says a whole lot of things to her that, that you and I at face value, value look at it and go, well, Jesus, aren't you worried that that might cause her to, to run away from you? Aren't you worried that that might cause her to not want to listen to you? Aren't you, aren't you concerned that you might be stepping on her toes? Aren't, aren't you worried that, that you're, you're standing in opposition to her worldview and how she thinks that things work? And yet Jesus just gently humbly and with a love that can only be expressed in him walks her down this path of revealing who she is who he is and what she needs and i think that for each and every one of us that are here today and we're going to look at some things this morning and and address some areas of our culture where we've really got this idea of love wrong and and talk about how when when you and i are talking to other people about christianity that we ought to approach it the same way that jesus approached it not because we're jesus but because every single one of us at some time was the samaritan woman and so we, we don't approach it with the idea of we're better than them. We don't approach it with the idea that we've, we've not struggled in our life or we've not had sin or we've not had shortcomings. We approach it as though the same as the, this woman at the well. And we're going to look next week when she goes into the city and tells everybody about how Jesus has revealed to her the things of her life. And they need to go out and figure out if this, this prophet is really the Messiah and hear his teaching. We're going to look at all that next week. Uh, but today we're just looking at how Jesus loves this woman and help us to define what, what is biblical love? What does that look like? How, how do we have it right? How do we have it wrong? So if you have your Bible, I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 4. And I'd like to begin reading in verse 16. And he said to her, go and call your husband and come here. Now, that is not the way that if I was getting ready to share with someone about salvation or even in the conversation, that you would think that this would be the way that would go well. I mean, Jesus knows at this point that it's not like it's a, uh, something that catches him off guard that she has five husbands, but none of them are really her husband anymore, and the guy she's with is not really her husband, and she's had all this immorality in her life. And yet Jesus begins at this point of saying, hey, let's talk about your sin. Let's talk about the thing that stands in the gap that keeps you from me. And, and the, the, the conversation immediately turns on that of, hey, let's, let's talk about this for a second. As a matter of fact, to have this conversation, I'd like for you to go and grab your husband, and I want you to bring him back to me. And she, she answers to him and says, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have five, hus five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband, this you have said truly. It's interesting that when God shows us love, when God is revealing to us our need for salvation, when we are, we are in that time in our life, when God is cultivating that seed and trying to express the gospel, it is impossible to get to that without going through our sin. I believe the reason that Jesus has this conversation with her ties into everything we've been talking about it from chapter 3 all the way to this point that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. The fact that he gave his son to die on a cross for our sins. And we might, we might understand that for him to have this conversation with her after having talking to Nicodemus and now trying to express to her that I'm the living water and you can have a drink from this. And maybe her curiosity is just a little bit of peaked of how do I get a drink of that water? How does that take place? And Jesus begins with, well, first we've got to address your sin. He doesn't, he doesn't pull every single one of them out that day, although when we get saved, God forgives us of every single sin of our life. But he, he pulls out that sin that would be the most impressing upon her life. You see, because one of the reasons that most people believe that she went to the well is because of the reputation she had in the town. She didn't want to be around those people. And in their culture, in, in Jewish culture, if they were keep, keeping to some of the Old Testament customs, as a matter of fact, the things that she had done, the, the, the penalty of that was to be stoned to death. I mean, even in their own society, this wasn't something that was looked good upon. And Jesus pulls it out immediately and says, hey, let's, let's talk about your sin. Now, now her, interest, her interest is really piqued. 
Because she's got to be wondering to herself, here's a man that came to a well and I'd never met him before in my entire life and he, he's Jewish and I'm, I'm Samaritan and now he's asking me for a drink of water and Jews don't usually do that and he doesn't even have a pail so not only does he want me to fetch him water but he wants him to fetch me water from his pail. And then, he, and then he tells me that he can give me water that will never run dry. As a matter of fact, it will be a water that wells up inside of me to eternal life. So now, not only has he asked for water, but he has now expressed to me that he will give me water that makes it so I never have to come back to this well to get water ever again. She hasn't quite caught on to the spiritual sense of it yet. But now he begins to unveil things about her life that she has to be thinking to herself, how in the world does he know those things about me? And so her only conclusion is, he has to be a prophet. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And now she has questions. Now remember at the beginning, Jesus had this conversation with her, was trying to express to her that there was this water that he could give. And for her, the entire time was, I just physically don't want to come back to this well. If you can make it so I don't have to come back and get physical water every single day to take back so that I don't die of thirst, then I'd really like to have the water that you're offering. She doesn't understand the, the spiritual sense of what Jesus is trying to say to, to her in that moment. She's still stuck on the physical sense in which her world is. And she says, sir, I'd love to have some of that water. But now she, we, we get to kind of the next lever. Jesus pulls out her sin and begins to reveal that to her. And she says, well, you have to be a prophet. How could you possibly know those things unless you were a prophet? Now her attention turns. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people and you people being the, the Jewish people in the south, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And it comes back to that issue of why the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other so much. If you remember, I had, I had, I had talked about how in the days of the kings when the Assyrians came over and took over the northern kingdom and, and they took the Jews out of the land and put them into other areas and then they slowly came back and they intermarried with the people that were there and they become uh, what the southern uh, true Jews, if you would say that, would call that they would call them half-breeds. They were half-Gentile, they were half-Jew, and they wanted nothing to do with them. As a matter of fact, they wanted so little to do with them that when it became time to rebuild the temple and the walls, uh, they said, you can't come help. You can't be a part of this. So that in 400 BC, the Samaritans build their own place of worship on top of Mount Gerizim, and in 128, 272 years later, the Jews come in and tear it down. They destroy their place of worship. Well, that place of worship stood for everything. You can see that even in this moment, 130 years later, 100 and, 135, 160 years later, that this woman is still fixated on the fact that that's the place that they worship, even though you Jewish people had come and torn down our place of worship because you believe that at Jerusalem is the place that we're supposed to worship. That mountain stood for everything to those people. It would, it would be similar to uh, our... our uh, the White House was built about 244 years ago, and it would be similar to the fact if somebody came in and dropped a bomb on it and wiped it out in a second. We'd have major issue with that. It stands for a lot of things in our culture and our society. Well, imagine for this woman, they came in and they destroyed her place of worship. And now one of those people that stands as a representation of those people who did that is now here having a spiritual conversation with her. And she says, well, sir, aren't you in the wrong spot? Isn't your place of worship south of here? We worship here, you worship there. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you, have, what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus takes another physical reality of her life and gives her a spiritual reality that is far more significant. She, she's worried about where people worship, whether it's more, more powerful to worship where she's at, 
or if it's more powerful to worship in Jerusalem, which he stands as a representative of. And so when she says, hey, this is our place of worship, you worship somewhere else, you have your beliefs, and she knows that. They only, they only include the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and their belief system. They don't hold to the, to the prophets or any of those writings, the, the kings, the historical books. They don't, they don't hold to any of that. They only hold to the first five books. Well, she being a Samaritan knows that they hold to the rest of the Old Testament canon. There, there's a difference in belief. There's a difference in location. There's a difference in their spiritual sense of who God is and what God does and how God works. And Jesus says, you're worried about a mountain that you worship on now. And he gives, her, he gives her this beautiful truth. Jesus doesn't tell her, but if you go south to Jerusalem, I'll show you how to really worship. Now what's interesting is in the midst of her, her pain and her hurt because they had destroyed her temple, Jesus said, you had your worship wrong. It, it really is in Jerusalem where the Messiah is coming from. You weren't right. They may not have been right to come in and do what they did, but you do have that part of your theology wrong. He makes a theological correction for her and says that it is from Jerusalem and from the Jews that the Messiah is coming, the one who will save the world. And he knows that because he's the one who's been sent from Jerusalem to be the savior of the world. He understands all those things. But then he offers something to her that is extremely uh, wonderful in this situation of saying you don't have to go there. He says, but a day is coming, in now is, when they will worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus says... He won't care where you are when you worship. It won't matter. Buildings won't matter. Locations won't matter. Facilities won't matter. Chairs won't matter. Lights won't matter. None. God. God could care less about any of that. God doesn't. God doesn't care anything about that. As a matter of fact, he he cares so little about that that he, being a Jew, that says that even in Jerusalem, which has stood for thousands of years as the place that his people are supposed to worship, and Jesus says God won't even care if they worship there. It doesn't matter. He says because God's giving an opportunity to worship in spirit and in truth. And it's two things. In the book of John, uh, the Spirit almost always is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And we, we've already seen that through this account of chapter 4, the references to the living water, and later in chapter 7 that that living water is the Holy Spirit. And now we have Jesus saying you're going to worship in spirit. And I think what Jesus is saying is that there's a day coming that when, when God has placed his spirit inside of you, and when God's spirit is present, that you can worship in any place that you find yourself because God is with you every single moment of every single day. But not only that you will worship in spirit, in the, in the Holy Spirit, that you'll worship that way, but you will also worship in truth. And his point to her is, at this moment, she has been incorrect about what God was doing with his people. She thought that this mountain was more important than the mountain in Jerusalem, and she had missed the fact that throughout the Old Testament, God had said, my Messiah will come from the Jewish people. And it's interesting. He doesn't just let her be wrong. By saying that you'll worship in truth, he's saying you've got to have it right. Not just any God, not just any Savior, not just any spirit, not just any word, not just any way. It has to be in truth. It has to be according to the way that God has said that we are supposed to worship, which means for her, she has to get that right. And this woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ, and when he comes, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. She understood that. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I think it's wonderful to know that God's point in her life was not just to tear her down because of her sin. God's point in her life was not just to point out some of her theological and doctrinal wrongness. It wasn't like God just showed up in her life and said, hey, let me show you everything that's wrong about your life and leave you feeling miserable about yourself. No, God reveals his sin, our sin to us so that he might reveal himself to us. It is when our sin has been exposed 
and we realize that there is a barrier between us and him, when we realize that there are things that we have done, choices that we have made, actions that we have taken, that, that create separation from us and him. But God doesn't just leave it there. God doesn't just say, hey, you've sinned and you've messed up and you've got all these things that are wrong in your life and you and I are separated from one another and your theology is wrong and your doctrine is wrong and, and you've got all the wrong ideals of how God works and what God does. No, at the very end of that, after he's revealed all of that, he says, yes, I'm the Messiah and I stand before you. He gives her hope. He lets her know that you don't have to stay there. He lets her know that the, the one who is giving the living water earlier in the story is the Messiah who stands before her. The one who can give her the opportunity to worship in spirit and truth is standing right before her. He doesn't leave her in despair. He leaves her with hope. So that at this point his disciples came and were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. And yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city. Friends, do you know what the key to the text is for me and you? Two things. She left her water pot and she went into the city. In the story, the water pot stands as a picture of everything she clings to in her life. She couldn't see past the water pot. Here, here Jesus is offering eternal water that would, that would cause her to never thirst again and never have to draw again and, and a spiritual water that would well up to eternal life. And throughout the story, the only thing she can do is think about the physical water pot. All she, all she cares about is not having to physically walk to this well so that she can physically drop that bucket down into the water and draw it out and take it back to her home only the next day to come back and do the exact same thing. And I believe in the story that the reason that John writes and she dropped her water pot was so that you and I can know in that moment her thinking changed. I believe for her, it was her, her moment of repentance. It was her moment of faith. It was the moment when she looked at her water pot and said, if this guy really is who he says he is, there are far more significant things right now in my life than carrying this water pot and she put it down. And not only did she put it down, but thinking back to the, to the moment where he said, uh, you, you have five husbands and the one that you have now is not even your husband. And she had walked all this way to avoid all of those people in that city. And not only does she drop her water pot, but she doesn't go somewhere else. She goes right into the city that she had tried so hard to avoid. Her entire life was different at that moment. We're going to look at that a little bit more next week. But friends, we have to arrive at a place in our life when the, when, when, the, when the spiritual sense of what God has done for us and salvation and his son's death on a cross and all of the removal of all that and his offer for salvation and all those things brings us to a moment where we put down our water pot. Where like this woman, we realize that there is something far more significant than that coming to the well for that physical water every day. God, God is not just thinking about the temporal life that we live here on this earth. Now, we oftentimes get sucked into that trap, and we can't see past the job that we work. We can't see past the, the places that we go. We can't see past the needs that we have physically in our life. But God offers something in a spiritual sense that is far greater than those things. I believe that chapter 4 in this illustration of how God deals with this woman at the well is a perfect picture of how God loves us. It, it reminds us of a few things. I, I, want, I want to just give us four of, of how we can allow God's love to be defined on God's terms, according to the, this story that we've just read this morning. Number one, God's love confronts man's sin. God's love does not leave man's sin unattended to. It, it is not within the love of God for God to just say, I, I love you so much that I'll just ignore your sin. I love you so much that I will just let your sin slide. I love you so much that we'll just pretend like those things don't happen in your life. I, I don't think there's ever a moment in our life that God says, I don't care about a sin in, in Robert Strong's life. God never has that moment. It, it doesn't matter how big society thinks that sin is or how small society thinks that sin is. Every single one of them sent his son to a cross. Every single one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's the smallest lie 
or the most heinous of murder. Both, only done once, can send a man to hell for all of eternity. We, we, we are shown all the way through Scripture that even with those people who are closest to the Lord, that God confronts sin. God confronted sin in the garden. He didn't just leave it alone. He just didn't pretend like no one ever ate off of the tree. He didn't pretend like he didn't realize that they had found themselves to be naked. None of that stuff. He, he confronted sin right there in the garden and gave a consequence for it. God confronted sin in the flood. God confronted sin in Moses. Moses spent 40 years in preparation for being the leader of Israel because of his sin of murder. He confronted sin with Abraham, and not just once. He confronted sin with Abraham multiple times. He confronted sin with Jacob. He confronted sin with David through the prophet Nathan. He confronted sin in Solomon, tons of sin in Solomon, as he broke time and time and time again the mandate for how God had established that kings were supposed to be. He confronted sin with the Pharisees who were supposed to be the, the spiritual leaders of their society. He confronted sin with Peter who was the leader of the disciples. He confronted sin with Paul on the road to Damascus. God always confronts sin. And I believe today that God confronts sin in our life. And friends, we, we, should, we shouldn't push back against that as though, as though that is some negative thing for us to think about. We, we should embrace that God wants to help us rid our lives of sin. We, we should embrace the fact that God has made a way that our sin does not have to keep us in separation from him. God does not let sin slide. Number two, our false beliefs are addressed. It's interesting that you have this woman at the well who arrives on that day and she has false beliefs on where the proper place to worship is. She apparently has false beliefs on where the Messiah is supposed to come from. We know she has false beliefs as a Samaritan and only holding to the first five books of the Old Testament. She, she has a number of doctrinal and theological issues in her life. And Jesus sits there and confronts them with her. So that when she brings up those false beliefs, Jesus doesn't just let it pass by. He just doesn't ignore it. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, let's not make a big deal about this. But rather, he confronts that. Right there, and his evangelism strategy is to tell her that she's a sinner and she believes the wrong things. How many of us would like to go door to door with that message? But the beauty is that's God's love. God, God's love desires for us to be in truth. That's the reason he said, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. Well, friends, the only way we get to the truth is if we understand the places that we are wrong. The truth reveals in us those areas where we have got it incorrect. God doesn't change his truth to fit our culture. God doesn't change his truth to fit our politics. God does not change his truth to fit our family dynamics. He does not change his truth to, to fit the, the issues that take place in our social society. God's truth is the same all the time. From the moment that he created the heavens and the earth, God has had his truth from that day to today, and it has not changed one bit. It's no different. The reality is that we stand here 2,000 years later and that woman at the well had her theological and doctrinal issues and today we have our theological and doctrinal issues. We have a host of them. But I want to speak to just three that tie into this idea of love. That tie into this idea of what it means to love God loving us, us loving God, and how we have royally messed that up in our culture. I think that the idea, if you were just to, to take a survey, just walk out into town at the grocery store or Walmart or wherever you want to go and say, what, what does it mean to love? What, what, is, what is the ideal of us loving God and God loving us? And I would venture to say that over 50% of the time, you would hear things like, well, God just loves everybody. Well, God just thinks everybody is, is good. The good, good people go to heaven. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, 
the way that God loved in, in the days of Jesus and the way that God loves today is a little bit different. Society has changed, culture has changed, family dynamics have changed. And I think that, you know, God's love has adapted with that. Those, those are the types of things that you would hear in our culture today if you were to have a conversation with people who don't know the Lord about what it means to have love. And unfortunately, that you would find in a lot of Christian circles of what it means for God to love. And how we, we've distorted that. And I think that when we have conversations with the gospel, now before I go down this road, let me give a caveat here. I don't think that the response to these things is that we should take up a, a poster or a banner and go picket places. I think that the example that we take out of this conversation is that when we go one-on-one -on -one with people, we have to have honest, real conversations about who God is and how God works. So that whether it's talking with a family member or talking with a friend or talking with a, a coworker or your neighbor or who might it be, but when God gives opportunity for us to talk about the gospel and what salvation looks like, we should not water it down to where it never deals with their sin. Because a gospel that deals with no sin saves from no sin. It's impossible. The number one first area that we have messed up, God's design for love. Society would say that God designed men and women to be co-equal in all things. That there's no difference. Eliminating the barriers. And I would say that the Bible teaches that God has not designed our men and women for the same purposes. And don't misunderstand me. Society has made equality something that, that any time there is inequality, we say that's bad. This is a difficult subject for us to talk about because our society has established a system in which anytime there's inequality, we associate that to being negative. And I would argue that God has created a system where there are some things that, that men can do and women can do that aren't the same. And we might call that equality or however you want to determine that or how you might want to phrase that, but the reality is God has created men and women to be different. And, and in our love, in our affection, in the way that he loves us, he has not designed that to be the same. We live in a society that any time speaks against that, it's considered to be unloving. Now, let me just say, God's love for one is no more than his love for the other when it comes to men and women. God has not designed one to be smarter than the other. God has, one has one does not have all the say, and the other have none. And God has not made one more important than the other. Not those things. God, God, I, God, I believe, loves a man and a woman equally. No distinction. But, but in his love, and in our expression of love in society, he's made us different. It means that within our homes and with our society, God has established a pattern for life. Being a man means something, and being a woman means something, and they cannot mean the same thing. I, I wish I had time to, to unpack this more this morning, but I really just want to ask one question, one to each side. If you're a male here this morning, I want you to think about this. What does it mean to be a man? Biblically. If you're a woman... What does it mean to be a woman? How do you define that? And in your definition, if it's biblical, it should be things that separate you from the opposite sex. That God has not designed us to be the same. He's not designed us always to do the same things. God has designed something for one and something for other. And I think the beginning place is for all of us just to say, what in the world does that mean? Our culture has so effectively attacked our view of manhood and womanhood that for some of you, just the idea of talking about it this morning makes you uncomfortable. Isn't, isn't that ridiculous? It, isn't it crazy that our society has attacked that so much that just to have a conversation on it oftentimes makes people uncomfortable? Can I just say this this morning? You don't have to be uncomfortable. It's okay. God, I, I believe God wanted us to talk about these things. I believe God wanted us to work through these things. I, I believe God wanted us to have these conversations, and I don't believe that God ever intended for them to be conversations that are uncomfortable. And because if we're dealing with it biblically, if we're, if we're dealing with it according to the scripture, if we have, we have properly identified the way that God has designed love in our society and in our culture, it should not make us uncomfortable. 
As a matter of fact, to talk about it the other ways should make us uncomfortable. God has called men to lead, and he has called women to help. This does not mean that women never lead or that men never help. In the Old Testament, God calls himself the great helper. So it is obviously a great and much needed quality in our society. It is the first two things that God gives in all of scripture for the definition of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Not one more important than the other, not one more needed than the other, but God's design for those two things coming together to make his society the way it's supposed to be. Number two, or number four. God has designed for there to be a distinction and a definite foundation to what sexuality looks like. God, God has, we, we live in a society that thinks that love is anything that we want it to be. You can love anybody you want to, be, you want to love, be with anybody you want to be with, act however you want to act, and do whatever you want to do. And I would argue that that's not how God has designed it. That's not, God, God has not said that love is allowing us the freedom of expression in any way that we want, even if it contradicts and goes against the way that God has designed us. It is, it is not that we can go against the nature of the way God has made us and then call that love. God does not say that. I believe that if God was having a conversation with us and he was talking to us like the woman at the well, her, her issue in that day was that they were confused about where to worship, where not to worship, the can and those things. Our issue in our world today when it comes to God's love is what in the world does it even look like? And I believe that if God was talking to us, he would address those things. He would not just leave them unchecked. Because I believe God's love calls to account those things that are opposed to the way that he has designed it. And friends, we live in a world and a society that has royally messed up the idea of what love is. We have a, a title and a claim to everything. Now again, don't mishear me. I, I don't think that's a reason to, to, to go to, to somewhere and to, to pick at their front door. I don't think it's a reason to start a Facebook page. I think it's a reason that when we have personal conversations with people, that they're real and they're honest. Because it's not, it's, not, it's not a motivation of hate. It's not a motivation of anger. It's a motivation of knowing God's truth. It's a motivation of knowing that sin separates us from him. And if we stop calling certain things sin, then we end up in a place where you can't even have the conversation about what it means to be forgiven. Because we've just made everything not sin. Let me get to the good news. Number three. Jesus makes himself known, or better yet, God's love reveals God's Savior. I said this at the beginning. God's purpose in addressing our sin is not just to leave us miserable. His purpose in addressing our sin is not just to leave us in a, in a, in a place of saying, oh my goodness, look how terrible I am, and, and I could, uh, my whole life is just ruined and worthless, and God's never going to love me, and he's never going to care for me. That's not the point. That's not why God reveals his sin to, our sin to us. God hates our sin. He hates it completely. But he, he, he reveals sin to us so that he can reveal his savior to us so that even in the act of talking about our sin even in the act of talking about our shortcoming he says but hey don't be despaired don't think there is no hope he also is gracious and kind and says i also have a savior for you so that when this woman is at this well and he's talking about these these men that she's been with and this life that she has lived and this water that she can have and she can drink from and, and she's standing there and, and the last thing that she needs is how in the world do i get this and she says i am he I'm the one that can give it to you. And even though she was confused and didn't understand at the beginning, and even though her life is full of sin, God says, I got something I can give you. I got, I got a hope that I can give you that all the way back in John chapter 3 and verse 16 comes through a Savior who died on a cross. And I believe John has just linked all this together so that we, so that we can see how this plays out in the gospel plays out in God confronting us with those things that his son died on a cross to overcome. God wants us 
to see him. He, God, God desires to break down that barrier of sin. The, friends, they're watching online, you're here in person, that there's not a single individual that I believe that God looks at and says, man, I just hope they stay in their sin. Man, I'm so glad the way they're living. I hope they continue to enjoy it. No, I think God looks at us and says, they need my son. I think God looks at us and says, they need grace. I think God looked at his world. I mean, I, I think the moment that we sinned in the garden, God looked at his world and said, they need my son. And finally this morning, an encounter with the Lord, which in chapter 4 and chapter 3 is God's love, forever changes the course of our lives. Friends, that woman did three things. She dropped her bucket. She went into the city. And then she did something else. It says she was rejoicing as she told them about how God had told her about everything in her life. Friends, when God confronts our sin and he gets a hold of our heart, we're not bitter about it. When God pulls out and dredges up those things in our life that we need to let go of and we need to get rid of and, and he makes it known to us that we have sin in our life that we need to overcome, when we, if, we're, if we're really walking in the spirit and in the truth, we're like that woman. We rejoice about it. We say, God, I'm so thankful to unload this sin and live my life differently. Lord, I'm so thankful that you have revealed to me these things in my life that I can move past and I can get on with so that I might be closer to you, live better in your spirit and live better in your truth. Yeah, she wasn't bitter about it. I mean, this is the guy who just opened up her entire life, the most painful things that she had probably experienced of, of being ridiculed in her society and being outcast and coming to the well all by herself. And God pulls all of that out in one question of go draw, go get your husband and come back and we'll have a talk. And when it's all said and done, she drops her bucket and rejoices that God's love confronts sin, convicts of false belief, and reveals the Savior to us. That's love. That, that, that is the kind of love that the people in our lives that don't know Jesus Christ need to know. They don't need us to, to tell them that, hey, if you're, if you're just good and if you just be kind and you open doors for people and say nice things and don't get angry, that, that God will love you and you'll get into heaven. No. That's false gospel. The gospel is every single one of us, left to our own devices, are evil, impure, immoral individuals in need of a Savior. That's just who we are. And we rejoice that God loved us enough to say, you can't save yourself from it, but I can save you from it. Here's my son. I'm gonna pray for us this morning. I'd love to pray with you today if there's things going on in your life. If you're online, uh, send us a message or leave us a comment. We'd love to pray with you too. But I'm gonna pray for us, and then I'm gonna ask you to stand and we'll have a time of invitation. Father, we love you today. We praise you for how good you are. Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, I know that I've sinned in my life Lord, I know that there are things that, that I do that I shouldn't. But Lord, I'm thankful that you confront that. I'm thankful, Father, that you go to war in my life every single day. Father, I'm thankful that you help me to overcome false belief. Father, I'm thankful that you made your son, your son known to me. Father, that you gave me a way to have my sin taken and put on somebody else that I might be set free. Father, you are better than we deserve. You love us more than we could ever imagine. Father, help us to love you the best we can. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. If you'd stand this morning, you come as the Lord leads.
All right, at this time, we're going to have our ushers come forward. Uh, we're going to take up this morning's offering, and uh, one of our deacons is going to pray for us. It's so good to be with you here today to worship with you. Uh, this is our opportunity as a church to give back to what the Lord has given to us. Uh, and I just want to say that if you're here today and you're a guest, uh, your offering is being here. And so uh, if you're a member of our church, then that's a responsibility we have for members of our church to give faithfully to the Lord. But if you're a guest today, we're just glad that you're here. And uh, we're thankful that you're here. So if you all want to pray this morning, can Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for this time of worship, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we ask we understand the words of the songs that we sung. And as we hear your truth proclaimed, that it will show us your true love. And Lord, through that true love, may we reach out and touch others. May they come to know you as Lord and Savior. And now as we continue our worship, pray that you would receive these tithes and offerings, bless them, use them to the furtherment of your kingdom. For we ask this in Christ's name. Thank you, Jim and Lynn. Uh, just a couple of announcements will be dismissed this morning. Uh, don't forget that tomorrow Preach Conference starts. If you register for lunch, that's at 11. If you didn't, conference starts at noon. And uh, for those of you that uh, don't know, it's, it's two days, Monday and Tuesday, and uh, it's just uh, preaching and worship. And so we'll run from uh, noon till about 9 on Monday, and then we start back at uh, 9 a.m. on Tuesday morning, and we'll run till about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then send everybody home. If you're thinking, hey, I, I've got to work, I can't, I, I wish I could make it, but I can't, uh, Monday night at 7, I would encourage you to come if you can make it. If you can't make it to any other time of the conference, Monday night at 7 o'clock, we'll have two uh, uh, opportunities for mu worship and music that night, and then we also have two messages uh, coming from Dr. Ammons and uh, Brother the Frank Whitney, my dad. And so uh, Monday night, 7 o'clock, if you can't make it any other time, that's the time that you want to make it is 7 o'clock on Monday night. All right, uh, Ladybug Bible Study, that starts tonight at Martha's house. Uh, there is a sign-up out here in the lobby. And then next Saturday at 9 a.m. here in the building is the other women's Bible study. And so uh, both women's Bible studies doing the exact same material. You just pick which time is more convenient for you and your schedule, whether that be Sunday night or that be on Saturday. Saturday mornings, and so they're looking at Jesus in the Old Testament, and they'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, men's Bible study also meets tonight at Brock's house at 6 o'clock, 
as they work through the Tony Evans series. And then again, the same with men's ministry. Uh, we have a Sunday night option. There's also a Wednesday morning at eight o'clock option here at the church. And so whichever one fits your schedule, they're both doing the same. I told you. All right, devotion tonight and the study will start next, next Saturday. All right. And then uh, also want to remind you that every week, uh, grab you one of these Easter cards. We had these made up. The purpose of these is that you grab one of these and you invite one person each week from now until Easter. And so you'll find someone here. There are some over there, some in the pathway, some out in the lobby. And so grab one of these and try and invite somebody to our Easter service coming up in April. And then the last announcement this morning is the worship, uh, worship and arts and media are having a meeting on April the 3rd. If you're someone that says, hey, I'd be interested in helping in the worship and arts, the praise team, those types of things. Then uh, April the 3rd, right after service in the multi-purpose room, uh, just past the bathrooms, they'll have a meeting. Nate will lead that on that Sunday morning. And so there's all kinds of opportunity from uh, soundboards and cameras and all uh, uh, the things they do on the stage. So there's plenty of opportunity there. If you're someone that says, hey, I have an interest in that, and I'd like to come and see what that's all about, you come on April the 3rd, right after service to the multi-purpose room, and Nate will lead that meeting. All right, good to be with you this week, and have a blessed week.